Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at the University of Cape Town, where we'll be talking about storytelling. Omar Bacha is a photographer and artist. He's also the founder of South African History Online. May Satoli is a musician and a program officer at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance at UCT. And Stephen Sugar Siegerman is the former owner of Mabu Vinyl and is one of the protagonists of the documentary film Searching for Sugar Man. Welcome to all of you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Lovely Thank you. Well, lovely to have all of you here. Uh, maybe if we could start with you, Omar. Uh, how do you tell stories through your, uh, through your photos? I mean, how do you think about storytelling when you take shots? Well, you know, my generation, uh, storytelling was central to who we were. Uh, is a way of re retaining our humanity at the same time asserting it because of the nature of the society we lived in. Apartheid tried always to, to suppress all forms of an alternative storytelling. And so you grew up uh, as an artist and as a photographer always trying to find new ways of breaking that, pushing back censorship, pushing back a narrative that smothered our entire existence, culture, history. So history was a very important part of recovering ourselves as human beings. So storytelling for, for us, or for me in particular, was to assert one's humanity, one's right, one's agency, and to then find ways to create a new audience to, to, to begin to mobilize people. So storytelling was not just about memory and about creativity, but also to mobilize people. And so that's my background. I come from a uh, time when I was, uh, from the time I was in high school in 1960, I was part, became part of the liberation movement. And so everything revolved around communication, telling stories, telling it in ways that allowed people not just to follow things, but to be critical of what was happening around you. So as a photographer, one had to find ways in telling to assert one's new humanity because as black people we were represented in, in the most negative ways in the mainstream media. And so when you began, when I began to take or work as an artist or as a photographer, what was important was to be able to show people as agents of change or of people who had dignity and not just being victims of the situation. So that was very central, that people had agency. When people, when we photographed people in communities, in their communities, it was around struggles, uh, around removals or you know, right for education or whatever, but one always tries and find a way of putting across people in positive ways. No matter how poor they were, each one of us had dignity and one needs to be able to you project that, but at the same time, respect each other. One sets out to do that. Whether one succeeds is another thing altogether. But that's a continuous process. So photography was a way in which I was able to merge my, my creative interests and the need, for a need to communicate with my activism. I then became part of a, a large movement of, well, quite an extraordinary moment in history because for the first time, in, especially from the 70s onwards, but we now were awakening uh, 
mobilizing and, and, and reaching out to people. But in the 80s, you had this incredible new movement, young people and the arts in particular um, became part and parcel of the liberation movement. Culture, photography, the alternative media was central to mobilizing people, building new audiences, not just mobilizing people for political purposes, but also aesthetically, culturally, there's a program. And so you saw, you know, uh, theater groups, poetry, music, every avenue. So the struggle was not just a political struggle, it's a struggle, a cultural struggle. So my work was not just to take pictures, but also to train people. Fair enough. And speaking of the training, we have a new generation musician here, May Satoli. Do you agree with what Omar said in terms of the combination of the culture and the activism and the music and, and the arts? Yes, most definitely. In fact, I think the cultural struggle continues. Um, and conversations around decolonization and discovering our African identity, I think, are universal, not only in Africa, but with the African diaspora and people that are now living in North, South America, Europe of African descent. And even when you look at Zimbabwe, where I'm from, um, music was a critical part of the liberation struggle. In fact, that song, and that's a song speaking to a woman leader, Buya Nehanda, who was also a spirit medium in the late 1800s, who led the first struggle against colonization. Um, and in the subsequent movement, that song brought people together, reminding the nation that we all have a role to play and we all have something to take up to fight against this injustice and this oppression. Um, and I think that continues even today. My own music um, intentionally picked up the Mbira instrument, which is a traditional Zimbabwean instrument. In Mozambique, they have something similar called the kalimba. But growing up, we were taught that, no, that's, a, that's an evil instrument. You should listen to more Western music or adopt rock or something else that's internationally recognized. Don't play the Mbira rather play the guitar or the piano, which are both beautiful instruments as well. Um, but now as I've grown and also through my own research and my work, I realize that if we discard our heritage and our understanding of our identity and the things that have kept the fabric of our societies together over many centuries, then we begin to lose the essence of who we are. Um, and so I've picked up the Mbira. I use Mbira in my songwriting um, and I was really inspired by Chuaniso Maraire, the late Chuaniso Maraire, and other musicians. Stella Chueche um, is another great uh, musician from Zimbabwe who used the music, um, which in the past was mainly for, you know, used for traditional ceremonies and things like that, but took an instrument that was used in one space to make it accessible for all. Um, combining that with contemporary sounds and guitars and other instruments so that people could relate to the, the instruments that we have in Zimbabwe and beyond. Now we have a different battle, I think. Often when people think about the liberation movements, they think of you know, liberation parties that have now become ruling parties. Southern Africa is a, is a case in point. Um, and the oppression that we now face demands that musicians and artists, photographers, poets, find a way of documenting and expressing and mobilizing um, that does not um, lead to very grave consequences as we have seen with other activists, but it still needs to be done. In fact, Thomas Mabfumo, a prominent musician in Zimbabwe, still lives in exile to this day. I mm. think he first came to Zimbabwe um, last year for a concert after many years because he was censored. And this was not by a colonial regime. This was by our own government post-independence. And so I think music still has a role 
bringing people together, telling our stories, capturing moments in history and in time that otherwise may not be expressed because of censorship, because of um, violent intimidation and other forms of intimidation that we see um, across many countries, which is very sad. Um, but I hope that it continues, and through my own music, that it continues. Well, good luck with your uh, continued music. I, I love your music. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Sugar, uh, you are obviously involved in the music world as well because you captured the story of, of Rodriguez and his influence on South Africa. Mm. Would you want to say a word or two about that? Well, yes, I'm, I'm in esteem of my, uh, uh, of my colleagues here because as a photographer and as a musician, their storytelling comes through um, a very fo specific focus to the liberalization of, of Southern Africa over the past many years. My story just actually ha happened to me. I got involved in a very weird story. I didn't have, I didn't come from any context. I was just a reader who liked music. And the story happened. And when Rodriguez came here, when we found him and brought him back, he did the concert. Afterwards, I thought, that can't just be it. This is the most ridiculous story I've ever heard, apart from the fact that I'm involved in it. It is a ridiculous story. And I saw it as a story. And I used as many ways as possible to get the story out there, to let get him well known. We had a website. The web, the web had just started. So social media came just at the right time for Rodriguez. If it had happened back then, no one would have heard about him. But he waited for the, media, the social media era. We used the website. We took him to London. We put the story in newspapers in The Guardian. Um, then they released the album in America and we wrote the liner notes in the booklet and the light in the attic re-release. And then a guy came to me from, from Sweden called Malik and said, let's make a short 15 minute thing. And I always just said yes, because it was a story. It was a story that I knew if people heard the story, they'd go, no ways. And then they go listen to the music and they go, wow, this music's really good. And that was the link. Mm -hmm. And then Malik made this movie and we took it to the Sundance Film Festival not, and they opened the festival with it. I just watched this movie. People watched this movie and it changed their lives. He made a magnificent movie and he just told the story. That's all it was. He just told the story in a way that it, when a good story brings you in, holds you and uplifts you. Mm -hmm. Like a good photograph. A good photograph tells a story. You know that, Omar. And, and a good song makes you feel better about yourself. And this was a story that did. And then there's a whole album of music. And we used, this, we used this, whatever we could to tell the story. And I'm happy to say now that around the world, people know the story and people know this music. And I, I mean, people, we had a record shop in Cape Town called Marby Vinyl, which is still there. We get people, we put it in the movie as an advert and people come from around the world and just, and it's moved. But I mean, two Chinese, young Chinese guys, they hired a van, they drove overland through, through Asia, through Europe, down Africa to come to Cape Town to visit us. That's how far the story has got. And that's just another way of telling it. So I'm very, I'm very proud to have been a part of that. Well, that's interesting. And I wonder, based on that point, maybe if I could throw this to all of you. So is there something unique about a story in South Africa? Or is a story a story a story no matter where you are in the world? Well, that story of Rodriguez travels. But it traveled when he came to South Africa. Some of us. We never went to his concerts, so there was a, but it was part of Rodriguez caught the imagination of young white people who for the first time found somebody who was articulating some of their concerns. Exactly. But it didn't register with us in the same way as a story or a song by uh, Johnny Clegg or Marie Makeba. That's right. So we had these two different worlds. And now these two worlds come together and we now tell a um, story of South Africa, which is much more nuanced, much more layered. That is not just a struggle of black people for liberation. It is also a struggle for young whites to li be liberated. That's and, and so Rodriguez was very interesting example of how stories change over time and how they are interpreted over time. And, um, and so stories travel. And all artists want their stories to be told or, or, or discovered by future generations, but they might interpret it differently. So it's a very mm. interesting moment, the Rodriguez thing. 
because we all stood up and said, but who is this guy? <laughs> That's absolutely He was correct. here, yeah. but he was so lived in another world from us. Mm. Well, it's funny you say that about the other worlds because uh, Johnny Clegg uh, has been a guest on this show. And one of the things that intrigued me about uh, his work was when, when he was a young boy, he actually learned to dance uh, in another world. Yes. Mm. But he combined them in some way. Yep. It's, it's what's important is that we lived in very compartmentalized worlds, very, very strictly compartmentalized, physically but psychologically. And for us to be able to begin to hear new words, new stories, new experiences, one has to begin to have, uh, to, to expose oneself. Because if you don't, then you don't listen. If you don't listen, you can't tell. And so what happens in a highly structured, racially divided and politically uh, divided society or repressive society, memory and constructing stories become a form of weapon. And it actually is a weapon because it opens up not just a weapon, but a creative way of dealing with the world. Your audience is as important as your own sense of telling the story. Because if you tell this, you have to find an audience or you have to create an audience. Because without that audience, there's no story. It's interesting you say that because the other night I went to a, uh, a performance, a young perfor uh, a perform and I saw some young performers and they were singing about stories that I hadn't heard in South Africa before. And I couldn't tell whether it's because I'm not South African, even though I know a lot about South Africa, or it's because I'm not 21. And I couldn't tell, but maybe the storytelling does ebb and flow, and maybe there are lots of ways of, of presenting ideas. And in, in, in May, in your music, do you try to capture different generations into what you're trying to communicate as you're creating a song? Yes, um, but I think I don't intentionally set out to say um, which audience do I want to capture when I'm writing a song. It's a creative process. If anything, I like that process to connect quite authentically with my own emotions and thoughts on an issue. So I'll give you an example. I, I um, wrote a song called House of Stone. Um, House of Stone is the Zimbabwean translation of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe means Zimbabwe, House of Stone. Um, and the song captured the moment just before President, former President Mugabe stepped down. I wanted to capture the emotion, the hope, uh, the sense of togetherness in the country. People of all races, languages, cultures um, came together to march for the first time in, wow, my mom said it reminded her of 1980. The song was quite emotional for me because then the chorus speaks to a ceiling being removed and suddenly you know the dark times have gone um, and now Zimbabwe can arise, Zimbabwe can arise. This house of stone will rise. I found that it resonates not only with Zimbabweans this song because people from Cameroon have experienced a similar kind of um, government and, and, and political developmental challenges in Cameroon, in Uganda, in a number of countries across Africa that are experiencing this struggle. Even in South Africa, what we now call the dark years of corruption in, in mm. South Africa, people also marched against that to say, this is not what we envisioned in 94. We can't allow this kind of impunity to continue. The song in itself resonates with the spirit of activism the spirit of saying no to injustice, no to a lack of accountability amongst leaders in Africa and beyond. And so I think often the human emotions and the human connection is beyond context uh, in a way that one would classify an audience or um, a, a commercial base. Oh, you know, I'm writing this song for 14 year olds. It has to sound like, you know, it has to have this particular beat or this electric riff and uh, no, it's not like that. I think emotions resonate across cultures and across space and across time. People like Johnny Clegg, 
um, were influential to me as a child. Brenda Fassi mm. was influential to me as a child and recognized within Africa as, as, as musical um, leaders of change because of the emotions they evoked um, in the hearts of people and in our hearts and still evoke in our hearts. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Sugar, do you have a thought or two about well, that? Well, I agree with that because Johnny Clegg, I mean, don't get me started on Johnny Clegg. I've I followed him since Hilton Rosenthal brought out the first Judica album. Blew my mind. The thing about Johnny Clegg emphasizes, I think, about the important thing about songs and photography is tell a story. Tell a story. If you can tell a story, it's so much more interesting. And Johnny Clegg told us stories that we didn't know. He told us about the, the Zulus in the hostels and he told us about the dancing and he told us we didn't know. We lived in a compartmentalized society. It was. You didn't know about Rodriguez. We didn't know about, about that stuff. And it was these guys. It was through the music. Surreptitiously that we found out what was going on. So we all ended up, you know, but that was so important, Johnny Clegg. You know, and that's very important, I think, yeah. I mean, you were in Zimbabwe and he was, and Brenda Fassi, she also told stories, but not similar stories to Johnny Clegg, I don't think, yeah. Mm. Symbols are very important. You know, today we, we look at world where thousands of people are migrating mm. under incredibly difficult conditions. And it links us to the journeys of slaves or mm. indentured or people and while we might not understand the language that each one speaks, we are understanding the experience from our own understanding of our past to say, but that is wrong, what is happening. And then you get a musician who, who bridges all of that. Uh, or, you know, uh, in most cases, the greatest storytellers are musicians. That's agreed. You know, that helps unite us and have empathy for a human condition. But we have to open our child, ourselves and our children to learn to look at the world afresh and not be uh, determined largely by what our own experiences are. You know, one needs to be liberate. And the arts are one of the most powerful ways of liberating one's imagination and opening us to, to, to see the other as human. In South Africa, that was the moment in the 1980s where you, you were able to reach out to thousands and thousands of people through so many ways, through literature, poetry, performance, and people listened and understood and become active in building solidarity. And so, you know, storytelling is also about that, to be human, to understand and have solidarity or empathy for the other. It's a Something that we all the time marvel at, but we don't think about it enough. You know, we, we react to it, but we don't think about how important it is to remember and to then articulate something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it's um, off to you, man. Oh, I was just going to add that, and storytelling doesn't necessarily use words. In music, people think you're telling a story if you have lyrical content that makes it quite explicit what it is you're describing. But actually, music, in and of itself, the arrangements, the composition, tells a story. One may connect quite easily with Latin American music or Ludovico Einaudi, a European composer, or you know, um, music from India or Japan, simply by listening to the music and how it, you know, crescendos and decrescendos and, and builds and softens and the notes that they choose to play, minors or majors, and the mood that is said by the songs. Um, and that is a universal language yeah. that evokes emotion and connection amongst people, despite the fact that they may not speak the same language or come from the mm. same um, cultural group or anything like that, yeah. Agreed. In, in a sentence, I think our generation read books, new generation should put their phones down, pick up books, and read more stories. 
Well, I think we may need to leave it at that. Uh, this was a terrific discussion about storytelling. Uh, the three of you have had terrific careers, and I'm sure are going to continue to have terrific careers. So thank you for very, very much for coming on the show today. Thank, thank you, you, Steve. Thank Thanks you, very Steve. Much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like additional information about Omar or May or Sugar, please go ahead and go to omarbadshah.co.za or soundcloud.com slash mesatoli or sugarman.org. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please go ahead and send an email to me at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.